I'm Stockton Williams. I'm Executive Vice President at the Urban Land Institute, and it is a real pleasure for me to have the opportunity to moderate this panel discussion today, uh, which is going to be a discussion among some national leaders and uh, with you. Uh, our topic is Building Equitable Cities. It is the title of a brand new uh, ULI publication that uh, we are releasing today uh, at this session. And it is a topic that is resonating in uh, cities across the country where ULI district councils and members are grappling uh, with what in many ways are uh, unintended or unexpected consequences of success, of success in the revitalization of cities that many of you and other ULI members uh, can rightly feel very good about because it reflects uh, the values and the initiative that uh, you have long championed to redevelop uh, and revitalize the urban core. Now, though, we see um, that there are a set of challenges uh, that come from stronger cities. Uh, and that is what moved uh, us uh, to publish this uh, remarkable piece that we're uh, so pleased to be able to uh, debut uh, and discuss for the very first time uh, with you all today. And to do that, uh, we've got the three authors of uh, Building Equitable Cities. I'm going to introduce them um, very, very briefly. Uh, they will all be known to you, and uh, their, their biographies uh, are available uh, on, on the book itself. But uh, to my left, uh, Henry Cisneros, uh, probably known to uh, all of you, uh, Mayor of San Antonio, uh, Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, uh, co-founder of City View, a remarkable and successful development company and a chairman of the executive committee of Cisneros Siebert Schenck, a municipal finance firm, on too many boards to count and uh, a longtime member, collaborator, and leader within uh, ULI. Thank you. To my right, uh, Janice Baudler uh, is the global head of community development, financial education, and small business at J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, Janice has been spearheading the bank's efforts on a number of fronts in cities to actually bring the equitable development agenda to life uh, and articulate the business and social proposition to creating more uh, equitable cities. Uh, J.P. Morgan Chase was the funder of this project and has been a remarkable partner to us. We're so happy that Janice is here today. And to Janice's right, uh, Jeff Lubell, uh, who has a long, uh, distinguished career uh, in housing policy, uh, as a consultant, uh, as a scholar, I currently runs the housing and community development practice for APT Associates. Uh, is in high demand uh, by cities around the country for his insights in how to structure effective housing and community development policies. And we're so pleased, Jeff, to uh, have you here and, uh, and to have gotten a chance to work with you on this book. Uh, this is not going to be one of those uh, programs where the authors just talk the whole time about what's in the book because uh, the reason we uh, did the project was to uh, provide actionable intelligence and stimulate discussion. Uh, but we do want to ground it uh, a little bit before we open it up. Uh, and so we'll ask uh, our panelists a couple of questions, um, but at any point in time as they uh, engage with one another, uh, if you want to jump in, just raise your hand. I'll, I'll do my best to, uh, to see you through the bright lights, and, um, and we'll make this uh, as interactive as possible. To get us started, though, uh, Henry, uh, Talk to us from your perspective as a former mayor, HUD secretary, and, and active in development, uh, why the equity agenda is so important for cities and how it fits the, the role of cities in the future. First, let me take just a second, uh, Stockton, to thank you and ULI for your uh, support for this project. Um, when Patrick Phillips and Stockton uh, signed on to support this effort, uh, they've been tireless, involved intimately, uh, and it couldn't have come about from a production standpoint, certainly, without your involvement. So thank you for that. And it's a pleasure to have joined two people who I have admired for a lot of years for their on-the-ground proven work in the urban space. Uh, Jeff Lubell, who uh, uh, has written multiple pieces on affordable housing and other dimensions of urban progress, and Janice Bodler, who I've known for a lot of years working in the equity space at the National Council of La Raza and other places, and now putting uh, on the front lines of putting uh, J.P. Morgan into places like Detroit 
and really, really making a difference. So thank you all for your work on this. Um, I was involved with ULI for the last number of years on a project that tried to look at why cities are the appropriate place to invest now. And I think that project taught us that for a variety of reasons related to the new economy and the new demographics and the new entrepreneurial role of city governments themselves, that cities are uh, on the course to doing very well. It may be too strong to call it an urban renaissance, but in a lot of places it's very close to that. Stronger core cities, stronger cities generally, better relations between the core city and the suburbs. And as a result, there's a lot of growth. Name me a city across America and the numbers are probably better than they have been in recent decades and some are just blowing the roof off. Um, so out of that conversation came a discussion of sort of the role of cities in the modern American setting. And two kind of coincident things came to our mind as we were working on that. One of them was the national debate on inequality, which is real and getting more severe related to companies that are offshoring, uh, job uh, actual wage levels in real terms declining, uh, different patterns of migration, moving people around. Uh, but inequality is a big and important part of the national discussion that we have talked a lot about, but not a lot of progress in thinking through solutions. So that's sort of coincident fact number one. And the second, uh, is, is the reality that other levels of government have sort of washed their hands of inequality. The federal government is stuck on its budgets and deficits running into the indefinite future and stalemated politically so that there's even a debate of the basic role of the federal government. Now this is the federal government that's been the champion of a, a, an equity dimension, of opportunity since the Depression, certainly through the Great Society, but now sort of stepping back. And the states have never really been champions of uh, uh, an equity agenda. They have huge responsibilities for public education, for health care, higher education, but, but, but the states generally don't lead with an equity agenda. So the, the conversation began about, well, with, with the cities doing better, shouldn't we be thinking about using that upward lift that's happening, that economic momentum, that juice, what Bruce Katz at Brookings calls America as a metropolitan nation to engage those instruments in the cause of this equity discussion. Um, and, and so this book tries to look at approaches to doing that. Uh, looks at people who are already doing it, like uh, Atlanta, where Mayor Haseem Reed uh, has, has actually has an equity kind of template through which he looks at Atlanta's priorities and budgets. Mayor Duggan in Detroit, who though he has a very difficult circumstance, growing slightly, starting to turn the corner, but, but, but really concerned about the people who stayed behind and, and, and making good decisions for them. Um, and my own mayor in my hometown of San Antonio Ron Nuremberg, new mayor, but this summer actually uttered the words, offered a city budget that he said had been considered from an equity lens, which means that instead of spreading money diffusely across 10 city council districts, he said, we made the decisions based on where the need is the greatest. So that at the end of the day, after the allocation is done, it's not just the ones who were behind stay behind, the ones who are who, 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 were, who were doing well get better, but actually were making a difference to close some of the gap. And, and it was very well received uh, from the business community, from um, the, the op-eds, et cetera. So let me close with that and just say, one of the tasks we tried to do and that Stockton and Patrick held us to is to make sure that the prescriptions that are in this book are of relevance and interest to the constituency of ULI, which is, construction, design, planning, development, finance, et cetera, and try to make the case why it's important to you and try to make the, the case how your work of a lifetime can contribute to closing this gap in opportunity that unfortunately continues to exist in our country. Thank you very much, Henry. Janice.
Well, generally speaking, econo I mean, equity is, is viewed in terms of e uh, income inequality and the vast gap that exists. What we're really talking about in this book is creating, uh, rather reducing barriers to opportunity. And we actually had a debate on the title of the book whether we ought to use the word equitable or something more like opportunity. We decided in favor of equity because that's what the national that's that's the context in which the national debate is occurring. But uh, we're really talking here, I think, about lowering barriers barriers to educational attainment, to income, uh, so that people can move up. It's 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 about forward progress. It's about upward mobility, uh, and that's the context in which we define. Uh, uh, progress on equity. It's, it's great that you all are engaged early, so please keep that coming. And if I don't see somebody, just, just stand up and ask. No, I'm being really serious. That's, um, that's how we want to um, engage you all in this. But um, let's give each of our other uh, authors a chance to make a couple opening comments. Janice, what accounts for uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, a, a global institution with enormous set of priorities everywhere, your interest in uh, equitable cities and, and this project in particular? Sure, thank you. Um, so first of all, this came along at a really critical juncture for J.P. Morgan Chase and our corporate responsibility work. About five years ago, our uh, chairman and CEO, Jamie Dimon, and our vice chairman, Peter Scher, really set out a new vision for what corporate responsibility could be for a place like J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, at the time, we were um, putting out sizable sums of money through our philanthropy, over $200 million a year, um, but it was quite spread out. We were struggling to be able to tell a, a real cohesive story about what we were accomplishing. And uh, you know, in the spirit of big, hairy, audacious goals, uh, Jamie and Peter put their heads together and really said, um, if we're more strategic on how we put this money out, if we leverage the full assets of the firm, if we really get focused and disciplined about our priorities, can't we, in fact, uh, move the needle in communities where we live and work? And by the way, and you know, it was for, so first of all, I, I joined the firm about four years ago. Uh, for a civil rights advocate like me, that was quite intriguing about this platform and what kind of opportunity could we have with that level of engagement from leadership from our lines of business. Um, but core to this was move the needle on what? And at, at the heart of it, it was inclusive economic growth. That it's clear, it's, uh, we can all, I'm, I'm sure many of us in this room uh, might conclude that it's objectionable that, uh, that your zip code has such a heavy determination on your life outcomes. Um, is it, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. you're good. Okay. Um, but it's, it's objectionable, but it's also, it's, it's not good business. It's not good for the future of our business. It's not good for cities. And so, in fact, uh, uh, I think what comes to mind is the term enlightened self-interest. We really took a step back and said, it's good for communities, it's good for business as well. If we are really digging deep, and we identified four areas, workforce, community development, small business, and financial health, that if we can use the full assets of the firm to make a difference in those areas in place, we can really support inclusive economic growth where we aren't pushing people out, where we're not leaving people behind, and we grow the pie for everyone, and everybody has a chance to prosper. It sounds crazy. <laughs> that's a really, I think, a downright audacious goal, but that's the one uh, that we've set for ourselves. And so we, this is on display most recently in our $150 million commitment to the city of Detroit, where it's not just the dollars, but we're bringing data. We have teams of employees who go in for three weeks at a time, and they spend uh, time and energy supporting the nonprofit community. Uh, we have the J.P. Morgan Chase Institute. We're bringing a, a, really a 360 approach to this work. So when... Henry and Patrick and Stockton showed up in the office and they said, we've got this crazy idea for this book. I said, not so crazy, because <laughs> this is what we've been spending our time thinking about and really understanding with our sleeves rolled up in the communities where we're, where we're working, how this gets done, how challenging it is, how, how messy and nimble you have to be if you really care about documenting impact and trying to move the needle to create a more inclusive, equitable growth. Thanks so much, Janice. And Jeff, we've already gotten one good question about really what are we talking about here? And 
maybe you could help us get a little bit more into the substance of how this particular book uh, defines equity and equitable development and what some of the key indicators of an equitable city are. Sure. Um, so equ equity is a big term. It's a big idea. It's a scary idea for some people. It's a deeply uh, important idea for a lot of people. And, and there are aspects of equity that relate to race and to income. Uh, you can do rural, urban. I mean, there's just a lot of ways of defining it. But the, the, the focus of this book is really very clearly on one specific dimension, which I, I would call economic mobility. And the question is, how can we help every single resident of a city achieve his or her economic potential? And if we do that, then not only are, are the individuals better off, but the city is better off, right? Because the economy is stronger, and the uh, neighborhoods are stronger, and they're safer. And, um, and, so, and, and then a lot of the barriers that, that people are concerned about are, are, are addressed as well. And that, and that leads to a number of things that we talk about as ways to measure progress. So we don't have a definition. We don't say this is an equitable city and that's not an equitable city. What we talk about instead are a series of dimensions around which we hope to make progress. So one of those issues is income, right? So we have a huge amount of income inequality in this country. So we know a city is becoming more equitable when there is less of a gap between people at the bottom and people at the top. So there's more equality of incomes. And also, we know that that, that that equality is happening not just because people at the top are falling, but because people at the bottom are rising. So we, we're looking both for growth in incomes of people uh, in the bottom half of the income distribution, and also uh, uh, less of a divide between bottom and top. And you can say the same thing across a range of different metrics. So educational equity, right? Ensuring that the test scores uh, of, of people in the bottom are, are, are growing, but also there's less inequality between the top and the bottom students. Um, we uh, can look at indicators of financial health. You mentioned financial health, so credit scores, for example, or, or uh, financial well-being. We want people at the bottom to, be, to be, uh, experience improvement and also less in inequality. Neighborhood disparities. We talk a lot in the book about the importance of where you live and the effect of the zip code on your life opportunities. And it's, it's just a crime that people's life opportunities are determined by where they, where they live. And that for a lot of people, they don't have a lot of choice about where they live. And so we're interested in, in, in seeing, and we propose solutions for how can communities uh, become more equal in terms of the key amenities that they offer the residents of, the, of those neighborhoods that are determinative of life opportunities. So that's schools, that's safety. Um, that's you know, diversity and ensuring that, 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 that people of, uh, of all incomes have an opportunity to, to, to live in a community. Stockton, let me just say quickly, building on, on the After points that both have made, that cities have always been among the institutions that have been the most uh, progressive in terms of creating opportunity for people. People who've been marginalized started small businesses in the cities. People who came as immigrants throughout American history have used cities as a staging areas for their families' progress. People moved from the rural south in the 1930s, then again in World War II, uh, leaving uh, uh, sharecropping behind to work in manufacturing in the, in the industrial north and, and, and made great progress. The largest African-American middle classes are in Chicago and Detroit and Washington from those migrations. So cities have always played that role, but in some, in many cases, most of the time I would say, it's been a kind of a brutish process. It's a fighting process. It's a tough uphill climb. And the city has been, the city leadership really wasn't a, much of a force in that. They provided basic services and some political context. But now the idea is emerging that there can be some intentionality in the city's use of its resources in actually speeding this process, particularly when we see other forces pulling people down on the wage levels and educational segregation and, and, and things of that nature, which are real, which are demonstrably real. So the question becomes, can a city do this with some sense of intentionality? And, and if so, well, why? Is it, why should cities do it? Well, one is because that's where the people are who need the push, because they have the resources. And I mean, everything from 
the, the job training programs and, and, and the location of businesses and mass transit to bring people from work to, from home to work and all kinds of city serv utility services, all kinds of things that can be deployed in the interest of creating a, 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 a country that lives up to its ideals, even when other levels of government are stepping back. So that issue of sort of intentionality is key. And let me just say, with respect to your professions, which tend to be around the built environment, ULI, uh, there are all kinds of issues. Housing and affordability, location, sort of the density of housing opportunities near employment centers, um, transit-oriented development so that people can work and live, and um, the, the general issue of sprawl versus uh, you know, more core development, like the renovation of public housing, for example. So a lot of space-related, place-related strategies uh, come to the fore. Mm -hmm. Someone right in the front had a question. Yes, we can. Let me Great question. Make sure everybody heard it. It was, it was about what are some specific examples of solutions, and uh, we've got a lot of great yeah. feedback, I think. There are, I, I'd be happy to, but I, but I want to make sure Jeff and Janice weigh in with the, mm -hmm. with the things that they liked in the book. Well, so we, we talk in the book about what we call place-based solutions and what we call people-based uh, solutions, and maybe I'll talk about some of the place-based solutions, and then Janice, you can talk about some of the uh, people-based solutions. And, by, by place space, we're really focused on this issue of, of the uh, community in which children grow up, really, uh, but also where, in which people live and the effect that that has on your life opportunities. And uh, we know from research by Raj Chetty and others that zip code matters. And, 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 and so the question here um, is how can we uh, both help ensure that people of, of, of a diverse range of incomes can afford to live in places that have the amenities that are necessary for success, like education and safe streets and that kind of thing. So that's, that's about affordable housing, ultimately. Give some examples. And, uh, yeah, well, one second. Yeah, but, 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 uh, and then the other piece of it is, how do we improve the conditions in which people already live, right? Uh, and so I'm going to just give a few examples of each of those things that, that we talk about in the book. So, um, uh, starting with, the th with affordable housing, which we know you're focused on, uh, we talk in the book about um, strategies for, for both helping to preserve and expand affordable housing in communities of opportunity, um, and also uh, the other key thing, which we know that ULI folks think a lot about, which is how do we sort of ensure that there's enough supply overall in the market. So a couple of examples. Uh, Tyson's Corner uh, is a community outside of the D.C. area that has decided essentially to reinvent itself from a suburban uh, uh, shopping-oriented community into a more vibrant urban area. There are four new metro stations that have opened up, and they have developed a series of, of housing policies that are designed to ensure that as development occurs, they're expecting, by the way, to grow from like 15,000 to 100,000 people over the next 20 years. As development occurs, a share of that development is affordable to people who have low and moderate incomes. So that includes- And who are likely to work there. Likely to work there and likely to shop there. I mean, becoming and, and take the, the metro there. I mean, be, you know, they're, they're, uh, that's exactly right. You know, ensuring that, that that growth is inclusive. So those policies include things like a requirement that a share of new development is affordable. It's an inclusionary policy but they did it in a very collaborative way, working very closely with the development community to ensure that the targets that they identified were, were realistic and achievable. And in fact, they've gone back to the drawing board, as we talk about, and, 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 and revised some of those requirements recently to make sure they're more achievable. They have a, um, a source of revenue, which is a linkage fee on retail development that then also gets poured into affordable housing. Um, they've uh, dramatically increased density uh, particularly around these four stations. So you know, our point here is not that every community is going to decide to grow so ra rapidly, but, but that the conditions in which a community makes that decision 
provides a laboratory for a set of policies that are more aggressive than what we're doing now, that are more ambitious and ultimately will have more of an impact. And they're hoping to, 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 uh, to create, and I think they're on track to create over 4,000 units of affordable housing through, through these policies. Uh, so that's one example. We, we give other examples of, uh, of ways to preserve and expand affordable housing in, in communities of opportunity. I just want to give an example of the other piece, which is trying to uh, strengthen communities that are our challenge. Uh, we talk in the book about two public housing developments in uh, Atlanta. One is Centennial Place. The other is the communities of East Lake uh, and or villages at East Lake. And and the uh, these are developments that were among the poorest uh, and most challenged public housing developments. And, uh, and and as a result of a series of investments, both in in, in rehabilitating those developments, but also in crucially ensuring that uh, schools were built and developed and, and operated at a very high level. It's been through this twin uh, uh, kind of reformations of the, of, the, of the educational and the housing environment. They've really changed and transformed these communities into places that are vibrant, that are, that are really communities of opportunity, that, that people with choices are sending their kids to the school, including university professors and others, as well as existing residents and, and others, and, and it remains uh, 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 diverse uh, uh, and um, it, it provides a, a, a path forward and a way up. So that's only just two of, a, of many, many examples. And, and our point here is not that we have all of the answers for what all of the communities are, but what we try to do is lay out uh, a series of, of examples of things that are, are being done in different places. And our argument is that if you really want to succeed, you have to take all of these things and bring them together. You have to think about doing not just one thing or not just two things, but a series of things across multiple dimensions to really develop a more comprehensive and holistic approach to helping to, to uh, uh, really bridge the, the, the divide. And in the, the two examples that you gave, um, what's really interesting about them is in the case of Tyson's, this was actually a low residential area and they needed to uh, as they grew, they needed to be able to house the workers, to, to Henry's point. I mean, the, the low, moderate income families, the teachers, the retail workers. If For those of you not familiar with the community, it is um, two uh, very high-end luxury malls that are there, uh, large retail presence, um, and people were commuting and from an hour and a half away on the other side of the city to try to work there, and those stores were having a hard time filling those jobs because... Um, that's the, the cost benefit does not work for a retail job. Um, and in the case of, of the Atlanta examples, it was really about keeping residents in place um, and making sure that they're benefiting from the growth and improvement in the community, which I think gets to another important point that we lay out in the book, which, that is uh, problem identification is really critical here. You would not plug and play these two solutions in the same you know, in, in another community. These were tailored strategies built on data and analysis with equity in mind. And we go through what some of those measurements might be, what some of those considerations are at the local level. Um, but there are two very different strategies. Let me just quickly um, pick up on the, um, the people-based systems. Um, so uh, as, um, as Jeff was saying, we've got place-based. That means how you're going to improve place or how you're going to get people to a place that's already fantastic and already has all these drivers of economic opportunity. The people-based systems are things like how we're helping people improve their financial health. Uh, what is the education system which people are participating in? How are we training people for the jobs that exist in the community? And you could see how one doesn't really work without the other. You could really be improving people's communities, but if they can't get to where the jobs are, they're still kind of stuck. If we're training people for great jobs, but their, their living conditions are still such that they can't get out of their neighborhood or their um, high, uh, you know, high crime areas, it's not gonna work. And so another point that we, that we make in the book that just underscoring what Jeff just said is that, and starting from the top, having an equity plan for the city really means breaking down these silos and thinking about how all of these systems are going to come together and work in harmony. Sometimes that means you've got to prioritize. You may only have resources, bandwidth, attention to do one at a time, but you still want to be doing it against the backdrop of a plan. Let me just quickly give an example of um, that people-based system. I'll just pick one, the 
financial health example. The case study that we offer in the book is Cities for Financial Empowerment uh, based on the model in New York where the city uh, understood that in fact it's, um, it has a lot of outflows to individuals, individual payments. And they understood that this was a platform to have a conversation with people about their savings habits, how they might uh, have debt reduction strategies, and they could actually track the impact of leveraging these teachable moments with people to improve their financial conditions. Even very low income families can save when you get them at the teachable moment. Saving a family three to 500 bucks, having that in the bank is the difference between them running to a payday lender when something comes awry, goes awry, and something always goes awry, right? So we can measurably reduce the impact to city's bottom line by improving those financial health outcomes. Uh, we cite research by the Urban Institute that shows that uh, rates of ev eviction, unpaid property taxes, um, these are all real costs to the city's bottom, bottom line. And so this was an example where the city could use its platform to really strengthen the financial circumstances of low-income families and uh, both win for them and a win for the city. So Stockton, just a quick point of logic before we go to the next question, and, and, and that is this. Um, I think it's increasingly clear that the future of the nation's economy depends on what happens in our metros in our cities. Um, again, Bruce Katz, Brookings uh, analysis tells us 65% of the American people live in just the 100 largest metros. They produce 75% of GDP in those 100 metros and 78% of all the patents and research kind of innovation measures in the country. So we're clearly an urban economy, uh, 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 urban nation. So, so then the question becomes, well, what kinds of metros are we going to have? Are we going to keep them strong enough, given the realities of this inequality, given the demographics that are changing? What are the mechanisms by which we keep our city strong enough that we know we can build a middle class, we know we can build an educated class, we know we can build a world competitive economy in these places which, which are our destiny? So that's kind of the logic, if you will. Mm -hmm of this, uh, why this is important. Well, Atlanta is a good example. Atlanta's a, a magnificent, in fact, when we sort of did our own internal discussion about you know, what place kind of best represents the way this is going to emerge, Atlanta kind of jumped to the fore because, think of it, Atlanta was a small town in a fight with Charlotte as to who was gonna be the dominant city of the Southeast and then Atlanta landed the, the airport, or rather made the decision to expand its airport. Mayor Hartsfield, um, Mayor Allen. And all of a sudden Atlanta blossomed into this sort of connectedness point and companies started to come there to be near the airport because it would put them anywhere near the rest of the country and the world. They have incredible flights to Europe and Latin America, et cetera. So Atlanta has just before, I mean, who would have imagined Atlanta in the 1950s being the host to the 1996 Olympics, for example. So by all the measures of what is urban progress, Atlanta's there. But it was also during that exact same period, the incubator of the civil rights movement. That's where Dr. King was a pastor and his father, Ebenezer Baptist Church. That's where Maynard Jackson was the mayor who came up with the idea of using the airport as a device for creating opportunity for African-American entrepreneurs by sharing some of the opportunities to work at the airport and Andrew Young and, and subsequent mayors. So Atlanta has been this sort of, sort of incubator for the national African-American view of the civil rights movement. And, and, it, and, and these things have come together in a very, very productive way. Atlanta's not perfect, has a lot of problems, but it's, it, it is a case where, where, where the issues of how you grow and create inclusive growth and address without having to address race specifically as a point of contention, but rather as an element of, of, of opportunity and progress um, has occurred. So I don't know whether that answers your question, but that's the place I would select as sort of the best example. There are many, there are many others. I'm proud of what's happening in my hometown of San Antonio less oriented toward the African-American community, in this case, more the Latino community. But again, 
35 years of focusing on the things that it's going to be or that, that, that we're required to grow and yet at the same time bringing uh, a notion that you can harness that growth and make it work for people who've been on the outside and the result is a much more inclusive place leadership <coughs> economics the best example I can give you and I'll close with this is when the Spurs came to San Antonio I was on the City Council and it was a very exclusive club of people who could go to see the Spurs play, an NBA team. I mean, it was a, 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 a homogeneously white uh, uh, audience for that team. Today, five championships later, and a lot of economic growth later, it's one of the most diverse audiences you'll find anywhere in the NBA or in any other setting. And, and, it, and, and because people now have some resources. Entrepreneurs, educational improvements, there's a middle class that doesn't even know it owns one single debt of gratitude to all the work that's occurred over 35 years, but that's the American way, and that's okay. Let me just Did mention, you know yeah, just a, a couple things on this. So um, by no means we should not shirk away from a tough conversation on race, and uh, you know, there's, there's a lot that plays into this that you know, probably best all discussed over drinks, right, on structural racism and the impact that it's having in our cities. Um, but I think you can also move a conversation along by um, doing a few things. Um, first of all, um, meeting cities where they are in their language. When we talk to Mayor Duggan, he doesn't necessarily use words like equity. That was not how he framed what he was doing in the city. But when you're in a city that, I, I'm, I'm going to get the exact percentage wrong, but you know, nearly three quarters of the city is African American. He a, is city, a city that was once two million people. <laughs> And it's now, now 650,000. Yeah. That's yeah. how bad it's been it's, in Detroit. It's shrunk. And, um, and the people who've been left behind, who stuck it out, who are still there, predominantly low-income, older African-American individuals. He wants to change that. In order to change that, he needs to bring more people into the city. You can imagine the kind of tension that that, um, that could create. He has been very intentional about Detroiters who've been there through the in and out is a point of pride that they all talk about, that they're going to really bring the entire city along with them. One of the ways that his office did this and had this conversation without having so touch third rail issues is to focus on entrepreneurs of color in the city. Um, you know, their office did the math. If every black entrepreneur in the city hired one additional person, they would solve the city's unemployment crisis. Now, we all know it's not one for one. The math doesn't work like that exactly. But it, it became this mantra for them to understand that if we're investing in the dreams of local residents, again, predominantly African-American individuals, that's going to be good for the city. That's going to grow the whole pie. I think the, the way to approach this in cities is to start with uh, some basic questions around problem diagnosis, what are the core challenges to economic mobility in the place where you are, and who's most vulnerable. And if you start to solve for those two things, chances are you're going to lend at this um, nexus of race, income, uh, and geography, but you're going to do it in a way that is really about solving problems for the entire city. Um, just a final note on this, uh, I think the, um, the tool for one of, a really fantastic tool um, to do this is Policy Link's um, uh, Equity as, as a Superior Growth Model and their All in Cities Toolkit, which gives a, um, a really comprehensive way for cities to take a look at how they're measuring on, uh, how they're measuring up kind of status quo on uh, these different equity measures. And it starts to give you the conversation of like, okay, we're doing not so bad on these three areas, but holy moly, we're really off kilter in this place. And that, that gives you a way to center that conversation. But I would say that it, it's, it's almost a question that, that, that for which the answer is moot because the cities are growing. It is a worldwide phenomenon. We are now, for the first time in the history of mankind, more people live in cities than in, in live in rural areas. All over the world, this phenomenon is occurring. Economies are changing. People are living, ag leaving agricultural, subsistence agriculture to come into places where they can work. China has 100 cities over a million people today. In 30 years, China will have 200 cities over a million people. They've chosen to make that a national strategy for growth. They have 8% growth rate. We have 2% growth rate. 
their 8% growth rate is driven by the fact that they've been urbanizing for the last number of years. And they have to build for that urbanization, they have to do infrastructure for that urbanization, and, and they've grown their economy. Every continent of the world is growing in this way, urbanizing, right? great megalopolises all over the world, except for Africa. I'm on the board of, of Habitat for Humanity, and we study this question, and Africa is about to begin the process of urbanization, and the same phenomenon is going to occur there. Big places like Lagos, for example. The United States, our, 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 our biggest megalopolises are becoming more important to us, as I've tried to describe with some numbers. Uh, and I, one of the positive things that can come from that is the sort of the merging of of city boundaries with regions so that we think about them as one big economic organism, okay? But attentive to the equity considerations, like where people live as against where they work and so forth. Yesterday, flying out here, and I'll close with this, I, I was in the first class part of the airplane and there was a, a lady sitting next to me who was the nanny for a mother who was with three children. And the mother came and sat for a while, and then the nanny came and sat for a while. Beloved lady, she, the children loved her. They were climbing all over her. Um, she was from Guatemala. The family lives in Palos Verdes, which is a beautiful part of South LA. Right? And this lady is with them five days a week. But I asked her where she lived. She lives near Culver City. I asked her how she got to work. She gets to work in mass transit. She has to board the bus at 5.15 in the morning to get to this family. She leaves about 6.30, so she's back home about 8.30. From 5.15 in the morning to 8.30, she's dealing with the world of work. It's a few hours to sleep and does that five days a week. So my point is the, 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 the equity agenda involves things like being able to afford something near, near where you work, near, somewhere even remotely near. She's two hours traveling every day. Um, uh, each way. Um, so that, that, that would be my answer. I don't know that we're gonna control the process of urbanization. There's too many factors, you know, technology and trade and, and, and patterns of, of, of commerce that are shaping our big metros, but I do think we can think about the equity considerations within them. We have one here and then one here. Thanks for lining up at the mic. Hi. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts are on cities using techniques for solving equity issues uh, and uh, greater social ills um, that may be at odds with federal law. Um, for instance, the concept of sanctuary cities and offering services to undocumented residents or um, having like safe injection sites for cities that have severe issues with opioid and heroin addiction. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to say I, a word, I'm but go ahead and pass. It. <laughs> um, I think we, we don't address that in the book. I will say that. Yeah. I think we're going to see more of that going forward because the populations of cities are more diverse and have needs that are different than the populations of the states in which they are, and. Um, so some progressive answers come out of the politics of the cities. We saw that in Texas just this last year uh, when the legislature actually, for the first time in my memory, targeted the cities. A, a, a sort of a radical uh, approach within the state to take on the cities. And it was, I mean, it was really painful because, for example, one of the things that they, had, that they limited was annexation. Now, Annexation in Texas is the reason why we have three of the top ten largest cities in the country, Dallas, Houston, and San Antonio, and Austin just on the edge of the top ten. Right? And it's becoming one of the great important megalopolises, the Texas Triangle, in the country. But the ability to bring in that mall out of the edge of the city and create a AAA bond rating has made it possible for those cities to be very successful. The legislature said, we're going to require a vote of the people who come in from now on, right? Now, you'll never get anybody to vote to come into the city. Who would vote to tax themselves and come into the city? They might incorporate themselves and then hem in the city, like many, many other American cities are limited, right? So it's, 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 it's unthinkable that you would take the goose that, that, that gives the golden eggs and, 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 and hurt it in that way. Then they passed a legislation that said, and cities have to have a vote if you increase taxes over a certain rate. 
which is a big problem when you're trying to do capital improvements on a major scale because they're going to exceed that rate. So the question then, then, then was asked, well, why? And they really didn't have a good reason for these things, although they did pass them in the state legislature. Right? But they finally admitted the cities are blue and the rest of the state is red. So, I mean, it was politics. But we're going to see, I think, a good deal more of these kinds of things uh, because it's, it's, just in the demo, it's just in the politics right. and the demographics of what cities are. Can I just add, get some questions? I, I, add just one thing quickly about that, which is that w the last chapter of the book focuses on uh, a suggestion that cities think about a, uh, developing either an equity plan or an economic mobility plan to try to bring all of these pieces together and really think in a uh, cohesive and holistic way about, about how to move the needle forward. And, and the choice is really up to the city about how to define the boundaries of, of that focus, right? So if you focus very specifically on economic mobility, you're not gonna get to the kinds of issues that the last question are asked, right? But if you take a broader lens uh, and you think about a broader set of equity issues, you are going to start asking these kinds of questions. So I, I think one of the questions that cities might want to think about is sort of um, how do they want to frame the problem? Do they want to focus on economic mobility and, and really um, hopefully uh, uh, sort of there are a lot, there's a lot to do there, believe me, or, you know, develop a consensus-based set of policies that are going to help every individual achieve their economic potential and in the process deal with these other issues? Or do they want to take on these other issues more explicitly from the very beginning, sort of undocumented workers, uh, issues of race and ethnicity? And, and that's an important strategic choice that every city is going to have to figure out. Uh, as, I, I know as it's a forward. contentious subject, and, and, and there's going to be a lot of disagreement in the room. But the subject of sanctuary cities was the other thing that the legislature imposed on the cities, and basically requiring police, local police departments to pursue undocumented workers, and if they failed to do it, sanctioning with economic penalties the police chief and the chiefs of the department and, and, the, and the supervisors of the department for not doing it, right? It passed, SB4 it's called. So uh, the police chief said, please don't do this to the legislature. Please don't put us in that position because we need to count on people in the neighborhoods telling us about crime that they're experiencing and not being afraid of us coming into the neighborhood as police, right? But it passed. So this is one of those, again, those instances where the demographics are, are, are just different in our major cities and, and, and put us at odds with uh, other views. Let's get some more questions over here and then I've got a couple here. If you could uh, line up at the mic, your best chance of getting in. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you very much and I greatly appreciate the, the conversation. A um, couple of things I've heard which are very powerful, the notion that cities are probably the, the machine that we have that is the most powerful in addressing equity or you know, potentially in causing uh, lack of equity, very powerful idea. Um, the whole idea that um, you know, there's an enlightened self-interest in all of this and that one of our key objectives is reducing barriers to opportunity. My question is, Reducing barriers to opportunity gets us halfway there because it really assumes we're all starting from the same place. I wonder if you can address a little bit from that kind of enlightened self self-interest position. How can we address environments where not everybody is starting from the same place? And <coughs> when reducing barriers to opportunity, though a great first step, is not enough. Well, my, my quick answer would be, just if I may, just very quickly, would be is you can't go any farther than that. Not in the American system and American way of life. And, and I don't think I would advocate, and my colleagues should speak for themselves, but really all we can do in American society is give people an opportunity, a real opportunity. I mean, it has to be really soberly assessed. Is, 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 is the barrier really down? Have we really done a good job of that? But after that, uh, first of all, uh, there are no ways to require equity, to create equality. can't be done in the American system, or any system for that matter. Um, so that's point number one. And the second one is it's amazing what human nature can accomplish when unleashed. So put people in position.
to improve their lot in life through education, entrepreneurship, economic opportunities, and it's amazing what our society will do, uh, given all the, all the positive incentives that work in that way. So my question is, I don't think you can go farther than that. That's, that's who we are, and appropriately so, and it matches up well with human nature. I'm I sure would, a lot would beg to differ. I, yeah, I I'm would, sure. I, I would frame the challenge uh, differently, and, and if I could tease out a nuance in what you're saying. So um, the, the difference between equality and equity in how you might create a set of, of interventions, equality would be everybody in the room gets the exact same intervention without taking a look at starting place. And if we look at where everybody is in the room, they're all in different places and they needed a different set of things to really truly remove those barriers to economic mobility. So in my mind, and I, I do think we address this in this book, again, going back to problem diagnosis and understanding where the most vulnerable are, you would tailor those strategies to really respond to those needs. And that's not the same as kind of painting with a broad brush a set of interventions that might not accommodate for some of those differences. And just some examples in my own work of where we've, um, where we've seen this. Uh, you know, we work with a lot of CDFIs around the country. People generally know what CDFIs are when I say that. Uh, uh, so for those that don't, I'll, I'll oversimplify. The generally nonprofit loan funds, although credit unions and community banks may participate as well. And there's a large number of them that provide small business loans. When we were looking, uh, and the standard CDFI product for a small business loan is a five-year term product, and they provide that credit to an entrepreneur that's outside the traditional bank box. Great. It was great work. When we, when we rolled up our sleeves in Detroit, what we found was actually the the, a large uh, base of the entrepreneurs of color there were contractors that were trying to be able to bid on the city's major infrastructure project. If, if we would have just provided the vanilla intervention, we would have given our grant dollars to the CDFI to do the thing that it always does, which is provide a five-year term loan. When in fact, that's not what people needed in order to really get ahead. And we worked with them to create a line of credit for contractors. Very difficult product to do because there's generally no collateral um, and it's, it's a high-risk business. Uh, but we were able to do that. That fund um, were, uh, has now um, has put about $4 million out the door. The vast majority of that has gone to contractors in the city that are, built, that are bidding on a bridge, a new stadium, and major infrastructure projects in the city. So we, we took a look at where was, the, where was the opportunity gap, what was the solution that was going to solve for that, and we tailored it to make sure that we were getting to your issue. It's not that everybody gets the same thing, but we're addressing the needs of the most vulnerable and everybody benefits. I just want to add to that too, because I, I, first of all, I want to thank you for uh, your excellent summary of our key points. We paid <laughs> yes, him thank to, you. to do that because we want you to kind of walk away with these good points. I, I wonder whether some of the difference between you and Henry is, is actually just an understanding what is meant by lifting the barriers. And I'll just give you a really quick example. So we talk in here about a, a project called Strive. Uh, which is a partnership, an educational partnership in Cincinnati. It's, it's since been replicated in many other places. And what it's, desi it's designed to do is create an educational system that is responsive to all of the needs that people have, K through career, basically, but certainly K through 12. And it doesn't do that by giving everyone the same thing, and it doesn't do that just by lifting up the barriers. It tries to, to essentially recognize that everybody is going to need something different, and some people are going to need a lot more uh, help than other people. And, they, and, and, and it tries to create a system where everybody gets that help that they need. And it rec so I think it recognizes that people starts in different places. What it's trying to say is that the lack, the fact that we all, um, some of us have access to parents, right, that are really going to focus on their, their kids' college application process. And other people have parents who never went to college, have no idea what that process looks like. And we need to create systems that are responsive to that difference and ensure that regardless of where you grew up, that you're going to get the attention that you need to, to understand what college opportunity looks like. And STRIVE is one way to think about sort of partnering together across the ways to do that. So when we say we want to lift the barriers to opportunity around education, 
We're talking about trying to adjust for the fact that people come from different backgrounds and need different things, and that we have a system in place that ensures that people don't fall between the cracks. And that, that is really what is happening in this world right now. People are falling through the cracks, and as a result, our cities are becoming less equitable. People cannot afford to live there. We're not, we're not building into our, the way we develop enough opportunities for affordable housing. We're not building into our educational system enough opportunities for people to sort of make up for those barriers. So, so we need to think more intentionally and holistically about those problems. Jeff, the, 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 we're on the same side. Um, um, because you're, you're talking about opportunity as right. well. That's right. Okay. What I was concerned about, and I may have mistakenly jumped to a conclusion on the, on the gentleman's question, was related to the very, very first intervention over here earlier, uh, because what people really worry about is whether we're talking about people starting in different places and getting opportunity or some kind of mandates that have people ending in the same right, place. Right. That's right. And we have no system for doing that. Correct. It, Correct. We, we create opportunity and we, and we wish people their very, very best and we encourage them to, 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 to drive as hard as they can, but there's no way we ever end up stipulating what the what the end result is great we've got some more questions yes sir you've been very patient thank you sure well thank you and i think some of this you've touched on already um i think most of the discussion today is focused on what what i'd call rising tide solutions and things that help everyone places like tyson's corner where you're increasing population but i'm i think it'd be remiss if we don't acknowledge uh gentrification and displacement and i'm curious what your perspective is on what the role of city governance can be and what with whether there is a role for the private sector in adjudicating between constituencies that have trade-offs. And I think about communities like Brooklyn, like Boyle Heights, where the value of what a city can deliver uh, can be realized, but the people who receive that uh, are, dis or who would ever receive that are displaced and don't see those benefits. One yeah. example is what we saw in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to Mayor uh, Haseem Reed, who actually has set up it's not yet a full city program, it's a pilot program in areas that are, a couple of areas that are rapidly gentrifying because a lot of Atlanta is, and he's actually set up a fund in which people who have paid their mortgages, older, living in those neighborhoods for a lot of, long time, who would be displaced because of the rising taxes around them because of the gentrification that's occurred and might not be able to stay in their homes. So he's created a fund that allows that taxes to be frozen for them uh, in recognition of the fact that you know that's, that's their home, that's where they've been. Through no fault of theirs, taxes are going up dramatically. Uh, it's not a mortgage. They've already paid off their mortgage, but they don't have the money to pay the taxes and they could be forced out of their homes. So I think that's an important uh, initiative yeah. that speaks yeah. to this. Thank you for raising this. I actually, I, I wanted to get to this a little earlier. I, to me, this is a fundamental uh, to the question of equity for cities. Um, given the premise where we started, that cities are growing and that growth is inevitable, the question of displacement becomes the, to me, the core question. Um, and I think the, the, how you address it and the set of solutions kind of breaks down into two buckets. If you've got a, a willing, city uh, or you know the political will to put some policies in place then you're able to preserve housing preserve individuals and um, and, and allow them to stay and benefit from uh, the growth of the city <coughs> you don't have those policy tools you don't have the political will or you don't have a, a city that can enact them then you've got to look at the set of practice solutions and uh, not in the book but another example from my recent work we just awarded a $5 million grant to uh, a group working in Ward 7 and 8 of Washington, D.C., east of the Anna, uh, Anacostia River. Um, you know, the city of D.C. has gentrified massively over the last 10 years, pushed a lot of black and brown people into Prince George's County, and a lot of people see Anacostia as sort of the last stand, <laughs> you know, the last place. Um, but the writing's on the wall. There are um, somewhere between, I, I don't know, 12, 14 major projects coming, a new practice stadium, uh, 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 tennis stadium, a new bridge that was developed. I mean, the list goes on and on. What I think is really special about the project that we're supporting is that it, and we haven't talked about this yet, even though it features heavily in the book, is that 
core to equitable development, maybe intuitive but does not go without saying, is getting resident input in what people want for their community and then providing some agency for them to make that happen. So this, this project has really, over the last three years, held literally thousands of community meetings, individual meetings, community charrettes, community design sessions, focus groups, roundtables, to create an equitable development plan that was created by nonprofits and residents in that community. And um, you know, we, this is probably a different thing to, to talk about at some point, but for a funder and for a corporate partner, this is the kind of coordination that we need to see. That table has been set. We can come in and support the vision and dreams of the residents who are living there because of the work that they've done. They're going to work on a community land trust. They've got a strategy to support small businesses. We often don't talk about in the, in the conversation around gentrification, but they also get pushed out. And so that resident-led um, uh, kind of practice-driven approach is one that we're following uh, in DC. Yes, Thank sir, you. and then you. Uh, <clears throat> wonderful panel, thanks so much. Uh, just by way of background, I'm a political conservative, but in my view, this is an absolutely central issue in American life and must be addressed effectively in order for America to continue to cohere as a country. Uh, I have two questions that I'm sure are not covered in the book. One is uh, criminal justice reform, uh, which I think is probably essential to address the equality issue, and the other is the possibility of, of instituting compulsory national service, which yeah. would basically give every person in America a, a, a buy-in, a sense of really being part of a larger whole, and teach them skills that they may not get in the ordinary process mm -hmm. of growing up. Yeah. I, I'll just say this, that we, um, you're right that we don't address them in the book. Uh, we, uh, but <laughs> But we do, we do mention uh, particularly criminal justice reform because that is a really uh, important issue for equity. And we, we were just trying to be really clear about what we can address in this book and what we can. And would certainly encourage uh, uh, folks to really think about, about how to deal with that. Um, and, and again, we mentioned earlier policy links all in cities initiative. And that's one of the dimensions of equity that they talk about. In fact we use their menu to say what it is that we are covering and what we're not covering, right? And, and we're really focused on, 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 on kind of economic mobility. Um, but I'm, I'm also a big fan of community service. I, and I, I think we need more, this is my personal belief, we need more of these kinds of ideas that can bring left and right together in this country, right, around common sense solutions that really result in more engaged and informed citizens. So thank you for raising that. Yes, sir, you've been very patient, thank you. No problem, thank you. Um, so earlier, you dis uh, the discussion addressed uh, people-based solutions, and, I, and it, uh, the example given was related to workforce housing, basically. Um, I'm wondering if the book addresses um, housing in other forms as far as um, housing of the homeless, uh, housing for seniors. Mm -hmm. We have a you know, um, growing senior population, people are living longer, that's going to become a b bigger issue as people out start outliving their incomes. Um, also issues for youth, right? I mean, you have, you know, we've t kind of talked about the training and educational needs, but then, you know, there's a housing component that's needed, you know, with the population that does not have the resources necessarily available to house themselves um, in all cases. And uh, there's some other populations too, you know, criminal justice, you know, transitional housing and stuff. So just wondering, sense of uh, <clears throat> uh, people-based solutions for that, and then sense of place, place-based solutions, anything that addresses rural uh, housing for the rural uh, in rural communities. You know, what, what, one thing uh, I'll just mention is is this. Um, we actually kind of look at them a little different. We, we have housing as the place-based solution, right, because we're trying to uh, ensure that people of all incomes can afford to live in, in areas of opportunity. Um, and um, we don't talk about a lot of the things that you, that you mentioned, um, but we acknowledge, I think, that, that cities need to think about the full array of their housing needs. And I just want to put in a, pl a, a plug for an effort that we tap into, but we didn't uh, talk about today, which is there, there's something called the National Community of Practice on Local Housing Policy. National Community of Practice on Local Housing Policy. And what it's trying to do is to provide guidance on how cities can address the full array of housing needs that they have by, by, by thinking comprehensively about the different uh, 
housing uh, resources in the community and the different resources and, and trying to think about how to address them. And that would be something really to, to, uh, to pay attention to. It's going to be coming out soon. ULI is part of the advisory council for that, but it's, uh, and, uh, it will provide guidance on those kinds of things. Um, so uh, ultimately, it will be at localhousingsolutions.org, but, but that's down the road. So just, just pay attention to that as it, it comes out later. A couple more questions. Henry uh, has a commitment, but wanted to say uh, one last word. Well, no, I just wanted to once again uh, urge, first of all, thank you and uh, express appreciation for the careers you've chosen in the urban field. By definition, you're urbanists in your work because you're part of the Urban Land Institute. And I do fundamentally believe the cities are one of the great hopes uh, for, for our country. Um, and the work that you do in the built environment has equity dimensions. Um, and uh, you, may, you may not sort of see the connection instantaneously, but uh, I just think it's, it's if, if we may not have given you anything to work with in terms of something that's directly associated with your work, but if you can think about these questions and be supportive of, these, of this sort of general direction for the country, I think it's very, very important. I apologize for the fact that I need to leave. I have an airplane to catch at rush hour in Los Angeles, hard to do. <laughs> uh, but I have to I have a commitment in, in San Antonio first thing in the morning, so I need to get back. Right. Thank, well, you, thank you very, much very, very for much. Thank you. Thank you. We, we've still got some time before our uh, networking break and general session, so for those who've still got questions and, and can stay, I think I saw you, sir, and then over here. Mr. Stockton, do we want to just mention that afterwards people can Yes. As you leave, if you're interested, the book is available uh, here uh, at the front of the room and also in the uh, Petrie Hall where all the ULI publications are. Well, I'm, I'm sorry Henry had to leave because I'm from Dallas and wanted to say that the change in the annexation laws is just devastating and I was wanted to get his reaction to uh, how he survived such a, <laughs> a, a horrendous uh, legislature. But since he has left, uh, let me uh, ask a, a linkage uh, question. Uh, when we have linkage fees for, uh, which seems to be the most popular way to pay for uh, affordable housing, that obviously burdens uh, just the people who are going to be in that project. And uh, I, well, I just heard in Chicago where they just passed one is raising the cost of all the units to be built, uh, $20,000 up to 200000 depending on uh, uh, the cost in the first place. So uh, I, I'd like just to get your reaction, now, there has to be a better way, uh, I think, to pay for affordable housing. Jeff. Yeah, you know, my general understanding is that most linkage fees are assessed on retail and not on housing. Um, but there, there are, there are um, impact fees, maybe you're talking about on. on oh, in, the issue with inclusionary requirements is, is that you, what you really need to do is ensure that there's an increase in density to compensate for it, for it. So the key here is, is to make it, the development still economically viable and economically attractive. And to do that, there has to be some offsetting benefit. Um, it can be density, it could be parking, it could be a range of things. If you just impose costs without imposing benefits, then you're just gonna drive up prices. So that, like all of these policies, they can be done well and they can be done poorly. And part of your job is to help cities do them well. Yes, ma'am. Hi, um, I don't know if you address this in your book or um, if you can now, but you talk about equity or economic mobility, but being a part of a generation, AKA the millennials, um, that is almost gonna replace, there's so many of us will replace the baby boomers, but we also have extremely high debt. Um, a lot of us don't have, it took me a year to get a job and I had a degree. So what advice are you, or what is being talked about to help millennials and everyone coming after me, make sure that we have <clears throat> the ability to, uh, you know, have jobs that allow us to move up, but, you know, with the amount of debt that we have to take out just to get the education to move up is almost impeded on our ability to actually be successful and have successful jobs. Yeah. Um so let me say, I, um, I do not have a good answer for the um, student loan crisis. And I, wow. I have thoughts, but I would be out over my skis. So I will um, not get into the student debt piece um, specifically. But I will say the, um, I think the point you're raising does go to the heart of a number of topics that we raise in the, in the book, which is um, 
um, you know, in particular, you know, when we say problem diagnosis and thinking about the most vulnerable, we're looking across, um, across the income scale, across age, to understand what are people's capacity to grow economically, right? Um, student debt, um, delays in finding jobs means delays in family formation, which means delays in when you buy a house, which means all those retiring baby boomers might not have anybody to sell to. Like this is, becomes a community-wide problem and one that I think cities can, are well positioned to address if you can put it in the context of everything else that's going on in the city. And again, I use the, um, fondly the term enlightened self-interest to try to bring these issues to the forefront. I think um, core among this as well is a um, better understanding of growing industries in a city and tying the, the um, city's workforce training to those industries. And that I think we can get, we, we talk a little bit about it in the book. There's a large um, a body of work outside of what we cover here that really talks about how we as a country, and I think cities are at the front lines of this because what is the growth industry in this city versus the next city could be different, but really trying to get specific about where is the trajectory for um, demand for jobs and how are we both lining people up to get those in-demand jobs, making sure that they have the right skills, making sure that they get connected quickly, and that also employers are communicating um, exactly what their demands are and making sure that we're matching up people's um, credentials and degrees to those open jobs. So I don't know that that answers your question specifically, but those are two things I would say. Essentially, trying to put the, um, the, the challenges of young professionals in the context of the cost to the city overall, and then um, trying to take a deep look at workforce systems and entrepreneurial systems that are gonna be tied to the robust industries in a local area. We have time for one more question. Uh, I know this outside the reference to the book, but what do you feel about the present populist rhetoric that's dominating at a federal level and is now permeated into the cabinet level? What do you think that impact may have, uh, say, medium term on the problem and the issues and the improvement of equity? So, um, <laughs> Uh, this is another issue that we don't address in the book. Um, I, 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 I would just say this, that the, um, one of the questions, um, uh, we started this book uh, before the election. Uh, so one of the questions was, what impact does the election have? And I, I think the one thing that has, it's been really clear to me now for, for since 1994, I don't know if you remember the Ginrich um, sort of uh, revolution and the, and the federal recession. and. Uh, rescission of funds, basically, that had been appropriated. It's been clear to me since that time that the federal government is not no longer the locus of energy around uh, housing and around community development. But it, that it, it, federal government is, is not going to be ever expanding its assistance, and it's really up to the local governments to lead the way. And I would just say that... that um, you know, you look at the rhetoric that, that we're seeing at the federal level and the stasis that we've had, not just since November, but really since 1994. And to me, it just reinforces the importance of trying to get local, of trying to focus on cities and what cities can do. Not that the federal government's irrelevant, it's extremely important, but the energy and the creativity and the, the vision needs to come from the bottom up. And I think that's a way to really cut through some of the rhetoric is really to get local and say, what, do, what does this neighborhood want? What does the city want? And how can we bring people together around a common sense solution? Yeah, I really agree with that. And I, I think you can see that on display in Detroit where you've got a Democratic mayor and a, a Republican governor. And they, they've really been able to cut through a lot of red tape to work together on improvements for the city. And, and it's been done because um, it's really rooted in that local experience, it's data informed, and it's innovative in its approach. I mean, I, I think um, you're, you're touching on the issue. People are pissed off for good reason, right? The income uh, inequality is growing, the racial wealth divide is growing, the difference in off opportunity by geography within cities as well as the urban-rural divide, these are real things. And I think leaving the conversation just to that fear-based narrative does not do anybody any good. And I think all of us in this room are well-equipped 
to put forward at the city level a different vision, which is really how you can achieve growth, how you can take care of the most vulnerable without displacing people, without um, having an us versus them conversation. And in fact, when you get local, as Jeff said, a lot of these partisan issues go away because you've got to get super brass tacks. It's very easy to stay ideological when you're when you're up at the federal level and you you know you can make I'll, I'll just say that right you can you can do that on both sides of the aisle but when you're down on the ground solving real problems for real people you can overcome a lot of the um, red blue divide. Yeah.